last nine years, Rawlinson End endured. But like the maze that grew before the great house, its inhabitants were pickled, corkscrewed, maddened and without light. And in this sunless hole, overweening ivies reached, wrung their hands and throttled wisdom. Tunnels of ignorance and fear closed in Lucifugus clammy coitus. Only nightmare and dismay grew beards. But beneath the Indian arm wrestling vines, in the embittered shadows, good humor and song sweep tiny green defiance. And as a blade of grass will crack the pavement, the stench of so what? rotted away like forgotten waistcoats. And here we are again. Imagine a wanderer of the deep, cold, dulled, a crow's nest sailor, stretching his vision over a limitless sea, lost. Through fog and sleeplessness, bucketed and hopeless, half dead might imagine he saw, like a squinty mirage, landfall, land ho, and home. Look down. Now imagine you see through the dark and purple breasty waves, deep, a hologram of fishes, deep, a swimming mirror, deeper, and in it, the kitchen of Rawlinson End, twilighted. He sidled up to me, said Mrs E, and he said, he said, I've got to keep rubbing up against things because of my disease. I said, do you mind? He said he liked rubbing up against trees because the juice in the bark stops it from spreading. Well, I'm an ordinary woman, dear. Am I wrong? Well, when he woke up in the middle of the night screaming to tell me that David Attenborough was walking through his chest hairs, well, that's how he explained the droppings. Well, he called them spore and fumets. I said, fancy name's my eye, I said. From now on, we're having separate beds. The single shadeless light bulb was so stuck with horrified flies and fat, it seemed to glow through a drunkard's cheek. It salamied the table in red speckles and shone of coziness, and it took the sharp edge off things, and that's nice. For if it were possible to buy a dark bulb, that is to say, a bulb giving 60 watts of darkness, just strong enough to turn day into night, that would be the bulb Mrs E, the housekeeper of Rawlinson End, would prefer. She was peeling voles into a bucket, and she fix-eyed intently at a grimy manual entitled How to Cook Everything You Have Killed. Christmas present, this here book. Mm. Got it from that nice old Mrs Bledernot, what's got that nice lovely cottage down in Wanker's Grunge. Ah, <laughs> agreed Scrotum. And she's a kind woman, too. She always uses lukewarm water to drown her kittens. <laughs> Mrs E nodded happily. Her companion, old Scrotum, the wrinkled retainer, hawked up a bouquet garni and lobbed it into the bucket. He sucked horribly at his pipe. <laughs> you sure you gotta chew him first? It says so here, dear. Books don't lie. Can't I read? Look, mm. meadow potpourri. Mm. Ah, mm. potpourri is mm. well. You be needing a potpourri and a potpourri. Look up a spare pose just to be on the safe side out of this lot. I reckon this muck'll go through faster than a pint of rhubarb wine. <laughs> a bell jangled distantly above, and then through the speaking tube connecting the master bedroom to the scullery kitchen came Sir Henry's morning bellow, Mrs. E, and Sir Henry's morning breath. A dense yellowish gas compounded of rum, roll mops and curried eggs burst from the speaking tube in a throttling cloud. Poo! pooed Scrotum, and he struck a match. There was a blue explosion, a thud, and a scorching methane fire flashed up the pipe. The master of Rawlinson End, blear-eyed in a turmoil of troubled sheets and a quiz game of quilts, managed to douse his burning moustaches in a bedside glass of embalmer's infamous whisky, and he fell back on his smeared pillows, scorched from lips to larynx. He concluded that either he was suffering tremendous stress, oh great thou art, or something had gone very bonko with the respiratory system of the house. The pipes and the pipes. Scrotum had affected this wheeze several times in the past, but Henry never suspected. And so when Mrs E slipper slithered to the door and thrust her unpleasant turtle head into the room, Yes! Henry ordered a breakfast of kidneys, kedgeree, blood sausage and a bottle of port without thinking. 
and ordered Scrotum summoned. Mm, chop, chop, and bring me a plumbus plumber. Pacey, pacey. Mm. That afternoon, the wind blew stretch marks on the stomachy water of Rawlin Pond, and the clouds moved like the glance of an expiring cod away from Rawlinson End and loitered over the grey stalks of Concreton Estate. Window City, in the distance, blasted. The sun stuck its tongue out, had a little lick, liked it, and blew hot raspberries. Over the hazy blue fields, Concreton responded in glints. Its flasher tower blocks, semaphoring filthy words. <coughs> Bum. <coughs> Knickers. Minarets in raincoats. And people lived in them. Poor people. We are indivisible, totally ourselves. Individuals, totally ourselves. Mostly we do not agree at all. Listen to the neighbors, listen to the neighbors. Oh, it's murder living next. Oh, it's murder living next door. The day had a burning foreign menace to it, and nothing to do with England. England cowered, it looked all wrong and embarrassed in that light. The vanishing air sneered. Great Aunt Flory, still beautiful, in a gauzy crumple of lace and a cream spilth of chiffon, clattering with jet, stood sipping lemon tea in the conservatory. She stared through the inexplicably jam-smeared windows, over the rockery, over the sloping womanly lawn, over the rusty chestnuts, south-eastwards to the winking, flashing, obscene minacity of Concretin. That is the future, and Henry says it hates us. Oh, dear. At that moment, a wild-eyed man with matted red hair dashed across the lawn and El Grecoed himself before unflappable Flory. Sanctuary! Sanctuary! He implored. Flory smiled sweetly through the glass. Oh, I'm afraid the ground is too, too cold and hard to consider a proper burial at this time of the year, she cooed. The man shuddered, his face corrugated in anguish, and he rushed sobbingly towards the lake, tearing off his clothes. The unnervingly rapid thud, thud, thud of the rifle sounded closer now and sharper. La la, trilled Flory, Sir Henry Rawlinson fighting a courageous retreat against overwhelming rabbits. She yawned delicately, and Mrs E nudged past her, carrying a large wicker basket and a boat hook. You're not getting enough sleep, dear. Now, my old man, he was tormented. Tormented. Mm. I used to massage his head. Mm. Then I'd give him a high-velocity shock. Nothing nasty, dear. It's only the electric, I'd say. You can't see it. Well, that got him off, dear. One zip, and he was gone. <laughs> Ooh, just like a child. It's lovely. No trouble. He was no trouble. Oh, what need have I of sleep? when all about me walk as in a dream. Oh, you're lucky, dear. You're out of your misery. Me? Whoa! Oh, I haven't got the energy to fall asleep. Mrs E grinned as maniacally sincere as a Muswell Hill estate agent and slithered out into the garden, past a giant ornamental pyramid of sparkling pink granite. The pyramid was topped with a large, curious stone egg, like a seal with a beach ball. It was one of old Sir Hilary's many follies, and if it had once any meaning, it was now forgotten. Flory poured herself another cup and followed into the garden. Welfing, belfing with a great stamping of boots, Sir Henry appeared and staggered towards her. In that stark sunlight, his topian shorts looked marvellously correct. As usual, he was shouting, Scrotum! Lobster-faced and furious, Henry flung away his rifle and collapsed on a bench. In the harsh, paralysing light, as stilling as strip light and searches, like remand prison or in Sainsbury's, where it is always day, the garden was stock still. The red, hot sun roared and bristled like an argument of goldfish and intensed on the pyramid.
on the stone egg. Oh, well, the equinox nosh tonight and the big spring doodle. <laughs> and Doris and Boris are popping over and the Reverend Slotten. Oh, well, it's always a good blowout. I love eating and drinking. But if it's curry again, fear not. I have already several toilet rolls in the fridge. Is it curry? But Florrie was transfixed. It's a secret, dear Shush. I know I'm silly, but will you look at that egg? The egg was shuddering. I believe there's something in it. Nonsense has been there since my father came back from Cairo in 1888. There was a humming, and a very tall, angular man gangled towards them. He carried a canvas bag that exhaled a breath of lavender and drains. I am Mrs. D Giraffe, come to see about your tubes. Good old! Carry on! Just then, the stone egg began to rock, toppled, bounced on the side of the pyramid, and cracked open on the lawn. And from it, upright on two uncertain legs, stepped a large green reptile. Mesozoixorion. It turned its unblinking, beaky head to the sun and opened its mouth. <coughs> the creature was swathed in a pale yellow membranous cloak, and it shrugged and tugged at it until it ripped, and then was revealed almost the most beautiful thing Florrie had ever seen. Oh, Henry, it's so pretty. The animal skin dazzled like magic carpet. Henry roused himself to his feet. Well, strap me to a tree and call me Brenda. A scientific miracle, hollowed the plumber. The reptile sparked in purple, turquoise, emerald and gold and thrilled with life. Its iguanodon could be Jurassic. A Red Sea pedestrian? Well, well, that settles it. Oh, my more likely Cretaceous. What? A ruddy Greek? The bugger. They'll eat all the roots and berries, you know. Oh, Henry. What? The tenants might starve. But Iguanodon is extinct. And rightly so. Extinking buggers. They'll ruin an orchard. Scrotum! The creature was now alarmed by the shouts, turning its head and flicking its tail. Scrotum! Sir Henry, I don't think you understand. This animal lives 17. I understand very well indeed. There is only room for one dinosaur at Rawlinson End. Scrotum! But the old man was already at his master's side. His fez rammed tight, his face taut with anticipation, holding out the rifle. Go on, master. Knock him to Baliac. If I want your opinion, I'll thrash it out of you. Mrs. Giraffe, the plumber, was oblivious, giddy with enchantment, giggling. It's simply impossible. <laughs> oh, I don't know, chuckled Henry. <laughs> it's a longish shot. Henry? No. No. But it was too late. <laughs> Next time, the fate of the very last dinosaur, the secrets and the truth in the pipes, and a very great eating boom at Rowan's Inn. Sir Henry at Rawlinson End was written and performed by Viv Stanchell with music from Pete Moss, Kenny Baldock and Dave Swarbrick.